Today, our guest just got back from testifying before Congress on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. at the House Subcommittee on Small Business, talking about small business, the economic climate for small business, and some technologies that are affecting small business. So we're going to hear from him what that experience was like. His name is Dan Gretsch. He's from BizHack Academy. I'll tell you more about him in a second, so stay tuned. All right. Welcome, everyone. You know, if you've listened to this program before, we get great guests every week who we get to talk to. They're smart CEOs, they're founders, they're entrepreneurs from all kinds of companies. We've had Netflix, we've had Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Grubhub, Redfin. Go check out the archives and you can see some of those different episodes in there. And this episode brought to you by Rise25, my company where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You podcasts and content marketing. And you can go to rise25.com to learn all about what we do. And a uh, quick shout out first to Cesar Quintero, great guy, founder of The Profit Recipe and EOS implementer and all around um, amazing business coach and uh, shepherd. Um, you can learn more about him, but he introduced me to today's guest. Uh, Dan is the founder and lead instructor at BizHack Academy, which provides digital marketing training to corporations and marketing executives and businesses all across, uh, I believe all across the, the country with a focus on, on South Florida as well. He was news director at WLRN, which is Miami's NPR station, and part of a Pulitzer Prize winning team at the Miami Herald. He also, fun fact, co-hosted Miami's first podcast, Under the Sun. That's really cool. Um, he's worked for the Washington Post, Marketplace, PBS's uh, nightly business report. And, um, and now he's a very active member of the South Florida startup ecosystem and uh, a graduate of Princeton University. And uh, Dan, I'm excited to have you here. And I'm excited to dive into this topic and hear all about what it was like going to DC and testifying before Congress. Um, but first, before we do that, I always like to know a little bit deeper about people and about how they were as a kid. And uh, you actually had a nickname in high school where people were calling you the candy man because you were the guy who was selling blow pops around school. That's exactly right. You know, um, I played soccer growing up and we needed to raise money to go to uh, Europe for a tournament. Uh, we went to Denmark and Copenhagen. And so they gave us blow pops to sell. Uh, at a quarter a piece, and it's a lot of I blow sold... pops to pay for a flight to Denmark. I know, right? Well, we did. It was like one of like thirty things we did. You know, we washed cars like everybody. But I got really good at selling these blow pops. And so after we went to Denmark, I went and found out where the distributor was, where they got the blow pops, which cost about five cents a piece. And then I became, uh, and then I realized they sold more than blow pops. They also had M and M's. Um, they had uh, Kit Kats. And so I used to fill a, a little satchel and would go to my high school in one of the richest suburbs of Philadelphia, uh, the main line, and I would sell candy to ravenous rich kids um, and made a fortune doing this. Um, and it became really uh, almost an all-consuming thing. Um, my, my mother at first was thrilled and then she started to get horrified because I became known as the candy man. Uh, and it was very, um, it was very like, uh, I was like a very wealthy, you know, you know, eighth grader, but I was also like very declassé because all of the, you know, the sons and daughters of doctors and lawyers were buying the candy from me. And it all ended when Franco Siciliano, who was from the other side of the tracks, um, broke into my locker and stole all of my money. Uh, and my mom um, sort of felt like I was about to get into some kind of gang war. Um, <laughs> and so she forbid after before that, she'd been like very um, much, uh, you know, supporting me and driving me to the blow plot place. And then she said, like, it's all over. Stop. You know, this is distracting from your school and you're going to get yourself killed. And so I had to shut down uh, the, the the candy store. Oh, man, that's that's sad that it ended up uh, that way. Um, on the other hand, you, you found your career into journalism and other interesting things, which we're going to get to. But before we get to that, you literally today's Thursday, you got back. You were in on Tuesday. You were testifying before Congress. How did that come about? Uh, I understand it was your local congressional representative who saw an op ed that you'd written. And what was that experience like? Yeah, um, it was a little bit of like a Mr. Gretsch goes to Washington uh, kind of experience. I. Uh, it was definitely kind of like a country rube, you know, looking at the big city and sort of uh, ooing and eyeing at the at all the pretty buildings. 
Um, so I have a journalism background. We'll probably talk a little bit about that. And I wrote an op-ed uh, in my local paper, the Miami Herald, saying basically, uh, hey, Congress, um, when you guys legislate generative AI and ChatGPT and BARD and tools like that, and you absolutely must do it, uh, because you really screwed the pooch by not doing it in social media and look at the consequences we've had from that. So, because uh, there's still no legislation around social media. Um, so Congress, when you get to legislating this, and I, uh, you know, please, please make sure that small businesses have a seat at the table because this is the most powerful productivity tool in a generation. Mm -hmm. And we really don't want you to ruin it for us. So I wrote that editorial and I name checked this local um Representative uh, Congresswoman woman Maria Salazar, who's a Republican who represents South Florida, because I've been in conversation with her staff, educating them about uh, the small business uses of AI. So I just said thank you to her and her staff for like taking an interest and in, in asking my opinion. And uh, more, uh, she's on the House Committee of Small Business, and more legislators who are involved in legislating AI should do that. And she uh, really appreciated that. Um, and so when she had an opportunity to nominate a small business from her district to co testify in Congress, she nominated me and I was chosen. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very interesting uh, experience. Um, you know, one of the things is, uh, you know, for those of you who are watching this in video, uh, you'll see I'm actually holding up a baseball that's signed. Mm -hmm. uh, the chair of the House Committee on Small Business is named Roger Williams. And he's a 70 year old retired professional baseball player. He used to play in outfield. Uh, I myself am also uh, a baseball player. Uh, so I brought this baseball with me and then he gave me one of his signed baseball cards. Oh, he's, in so the hall cool. of, he's in the Hall of Fame. He was a very famous coach for Texas Christian University, which is one of the mm -hmm. best baseball universities in the country. So that alone was like worth the price of admission just to meet him, get him to sign my baseball. Um, the experience itself was, um, interesting. Someone, uh, said to me, Dan, we really don't want you to be disappointed by this, but, um, they're going to be walking in and out of the, the testimony yeah, the whole yeah, time. So, not sometimes gonna... these subcommittees, you know, it's half empty. A lot of them are not there or they're not paying attention. Right. But did, did you oh, have that experience? Totally. Oh, it was yeah. exactly what it is. So, um, you're, you're, there's a dais, right. Where they have mm -hmm. two rows of, um, you know, nice leather chairs and all of them are empty mm -hmm. with exception of about five. So when I walk in there, there's like five people in there, mm -hmm. um, and the chairman, his two assistants and like five other Congress people. And I'm like, gosh, this is a two hour test, uh, you know, uh, meeting. It's going to last for about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause everybody gets like, you know, five minutes to talk. I'm like, this is going to end really fast. Well, what would happen is each member would get five minutes for their question. Uh, they would spend the first three minutes bloviating about whatever issue they cared most about. They would kind of eke in a question with like 30 seconds left. One of us would try to answer it and then we would run out of time. And then that person would leave. <laughs> and then while that was all happening, in through the side door would sneak another committee member and suddenly there's somebody sitting on the other side of the room <laughs> and the way you knew who the congress people were they would put up their name their nameplate uh -huh. and once their nameplate was up they were like ready to ask their question <laughs> the chair would would call on them they would ask their question and then they would leave, They'd leave. <laughs> and so it was this crazy game of like uh um, there's like a green room in the back where they're all hanging out waiting for the next turn what mm. I learned was happening because one of them said it is they would monitor the hearing from their office. Mm. And when they saw that there was like a, a shorter line, they mm. would walk on in, uh, ask their question and leave. You know, for them, this is a media hit. Mm. This is a chance for them to say, you know, on C-SPAN, uh, their spiel. Uh, if it was a Republican, it was almost always about re over-regulation. If it was a Democrat, it was about things like affordable ha housing and access to child care, mm -hmm. issues that are important, but not necessarily totally germane to small businesses. And I can tell you, not on the highest, uh, they're not on the highest priority list for what's, you know, struggling, what we're yeah. struggling with. You know, what we're yeah. struggling with are things like dealing with inflation, margin compression, um, you know, hiring shortages, uh, supply chain issues. Almost none of that was talked about. Um, mm. What was instead talked about were whatever the political hay that they mm -hmm. wanted to make. Was that um, disappointing then that, you know, here you're ringing the alarm bell. This is what I want you guys to pay attention to. And they're not at all focused on it. Um, I would say that it was uh, I was so prepped to expect that this was going to be kabuki theater 
that I couldn't possibly, I, it was definitely not disappointing, but if I hadn't known that beforehand and I thought I was like coming to Washington as a crusading, you know, small business owner to change the world, I would have been. I just, I was disabused of that very mm -hmm. early on by the people who were coaching me. Um, one of uh, the people who coached me has testified eight times in front of Congress and he said, this is Kabuki theater and you are a character playing yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose... The other ex end of the extreme would be something that everyone's paying attention to. You know, last week we had, or the week before that, was these three, uh, you know, heads of Harvard and Penn and uh, one other university that got a ton of attention. It was the Saturday Night Live opening sketch and everything. So that would be the other extreme, which would be petrifying in its own right. Well, it's funny. Yeah, the other one was MIT. And what happened is Elise Stefanik, one of the congresswomen, um, basically set them all up uh, with a completely, um, you know, a question that you really, uh, there's no right answer to. So the, the mm -hmm. question was, um, if somebody on your campus calls for the genocide of Jews, um, you know, would you allow that? that? Yes. Yes yeah. or no. Yeah. I think it was it was asking about if it violated their code of conduct or something along those right. lines. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you know, they answered legalistically and she was asking yeah. for a moral answer. Yeah. But the bottom line is I, I saw that uh, and I was petrified. So um, one of the really cool aspects of this, John, is um, I am a part of have you heard of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business training yeah. program? And my business partner, Jeremy, did it. Yeah. So they have a voices initiative, right? Which is a small business advocacy initiative. I've been involved with them for years now. I've spoken to my local congresswoman. Uh, I've spoken to the mayor of Miami-Dade County. And so when I got this opportunity to speak, the, the first call I made was to the voices representative for my region. And she connected me basically to the Goldman Sachs um, PR machine, mm. media machine. And so I actually went and spent two hours in prep Mm. With in Goldman Sachs offices overlooking the Capitol, I could see the wow. Christmas tree, uh, the, the, the national Christmas tree uh -huh. from from the office. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it was like a, one of the higher buildings, and they prepped me for every possible eventuality. And it was very interesting because I've never been prepped before mm -hmm. for how to like dodge and weave and avoid. And, you know, it was incredible. Like there's really an art to it. And, you know, one of the things um, that they taught me was do not rush your answer. You know, when they ask you a question that has you a little off of your um, off of your game, take a beat, mm -hmm. take a beat. Um, and so I actually I don't know, uh, you know, your listening audience won't be able to see this. Take but I have a piece of paper, <laughs> uh, the only piece of paper I had uh, with notes, because I knew uh -huh. this stuff cold, is the name of the chairman, the name of the ranking member, the name of the woman who invited me, because I was not confident I was going to remember any yeah. of this, and then the words, take a beat. Yeah, you got to be careful with that these days. Now with these high resolution cameras and iPhones and stuff like that, there have been a few times where someone's like notes have been caught, you know, <laughs> and then it's published after the fact especially if it's something a little bit uh, embarrassing. But, yeah. uh, that's not embarrassing to have that, but yeah. No, no, yeah. I, I'm, I'm totally with you. I I was just more worried about the other type of viral video, which is me saying something stupid and it going yeah. viral and it ruining my life. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the in the end, um, the president of Penn lost her job. Yeah, um, it's a high, I mean, it's a high wire act when you testify before Congress, you know, and, and I don't know how full that room was when those – you know, uh, when the head of Penn and Harvard and M MIT were testifying, maybe it was an empty room also. And at least Stefanik just like, you know, went to town and it became newsworthy. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure exactly. So um, I know we'll probably want to move on, but I, I wanted to just tell you one other story um, that made this whole event, this whole, it, I don't even, I'm not even quite sure how to process this, but it was kind of funny. So I was one of four small businesses, three Republican nominated, one Democrat. Now, uh, the Democratic um, representative was a, a, this incredible uh, African-American woman, black woman from Baltimore who runs the nation's largest co-working space with a dedicated full-time daycare center. Oh, cool. Um, and it really caters to working mothers. And so she mm -hmm. came in to talk about there was a lot of child care uh, credits and provisions in ARPA and the federal stimulus that mm -hmm. came after a COVID that have, that have expired. 
Mm. And so she came in to basically say how hard that's been on working mothers and to ask mm. for that to be renewed. It was like an amazing message, mm. very inspirational uh, person. Mm. And then on my right was this fantastic, out of central casting, rural Texas business owner with mutton chops, a cowboy hat and cowboy boots. <laughs> And so I was like standing in between, you know, me and my purple tie. Oh, I, I think I forgot to tell you this. So I you love my, you love purple. My purple is like my favorite color. It's the color of my company, but it also happens to be right between red and blue. So like oh, I'm this guy yeah. wear, wearing a purple tie in between the red and the blue. Um, <laughs> and it was it was just wild. Um, as I was talking uh people have told me i got text messages about this that the that the cowboy who you could see see half of his face in the yeah. c-span uh live stream see one uh, mutton chop one mutton chop exactly <laughs> was making like grimacing at what i was saying just like complete <laughs> like you know so much so that my wife got a text message saying that i was having an affair with him um <laughs> and and then at the end uh, at the end of it, he he walks up to me, shakes my hand, and all he says is, "You're a very smart young man." Uh, and then he walks away. Uh, so anyway, it was a it was a wild experience. I uh, thank you for asking about it. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. All right, so um, let's let's go backwards a little bit in your career because you got this um, uh, amazing career working for the Post and Marketplace and and uh, PBS Nightly Business Report and all this kind of different stuff, and uh, you end up winning a Pulitzer even too. Um, Talk a little bit about your your uh, you when you and I first connected. We talked about the the parallels between entrepreneurship and journalism, and I, I'd love to dive back into that again. Yeah, well, let me give you like a very quick summary um, uh, 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 of the of my journalism career, um, and it's actually really meaningful that we're talking uh, in December of 2023 because my journalism career really started in, in December of 1993. Uh, 30 years ago when I was a junior uh, in high school. So um, so I lost my my blow pop business. I was no longer the candy man. I had to reinvent, right? Career shift, mm -hmm. uh, like so many of us. Uh, <laughs> and so in junior year, uh, I joined the school newspaper. And one of the very first stories I did uh, was a story idea I came up with myself. Um, when I was in gym class, um, I had had money stolen out of my locked locker. It, this seems like a common thing at your uh, <laughs> at your this high school, and it turned out Twice. it was a very common. It was a very common thing at my high school. Um, all of my friends had had money stolen out of their locker too. In mm -hmm. fact, when I did a school wide survey, more than half of the school had had money stolen out of their locker while oh. they were in gym class, um, mm. including a quarter of freshmen who had just been on campus for a few months. And so, I wrote a story like an expose uh, about this and. Um, the the campus administration, the school administration, had no idea how pervasive an issue this was. And I remember I was going to do a follow up story, and one of the people I had interviewed, which was the head of campus security, was no longer working at the school anymore. Mm, so he lost his job because of this. It, you know, they never said, uh, but you wow. know, one one presumes. Yeah. And what what happened then was I was just hooked. Like mm. it was a little bit like a love affair, but professional mm. love affair. I, I talk in my congressional testimony about ikigai. Mm -hmm. Ikigai is a Japanese principle of what you love, what you're good at, what the um, what you can make money doing and what the world needs. Mm -hmm. And for sure, my first professional love, my first professional sweet spot, my first Ikigai was journalism. And so I ran with it. Um, I went on to uh, instead of washing dishes at, in college, I wrote stories for professional publications as a mm. freelancer. I wish um, I'd done that. I actually washed dishes in my local uh, dining commons <laughs> for a year or two. I, <laughs> it wasn't I did a lot too. of fun. I did for two years and I got so tired of stinking, like, <clears throat> you know, like fetid water yeah. um, and, and that I started to write newspaper articles to stop having to wash dishes. And, Good um, and I, you know, I went from there, um, uh, got internships at the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, and then the Miami Herald. And it was actually as an intern at the Miami Herald, the, the worst assignment on the Metro desk was um, you had to stay all, all night outside of Elian Gonzalez's house. Um, this is back when Elian Gonzalez, yes. the, 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 the young Cuban boy who washed ashore uh, in Thanksgiving of 1999. Um, I was actually living in D.C. at this time. Yeah, I was working yeah it was the a White crazy house. story. Yeah. You know, his mother yeah. had died on the trip. So he was there uh, alone. His father was still in Cuba and he wanted him back. 
Yeah. And his relatives uh, in uh, Miami uh, refused to let him go back to Cuba to yeah. be with his father. And it created this incredible international custody battle with, you know, a country we didn't have any relations with, 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 with Cuba. And it just dragged on and on and on until one day the federal government under Janet Reno um, snatched him out of the house in a raid. Wow. And we knew it was coming. We were we had our sources. Uh, we, as in like the senior reporters, knew it was coming. But they, those guys wanted to go home and sleep. So they sent all the junior reporters, including me, to sleep to 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 keep vigil outside of the home. And my only job was when the raid happened um, to call the managing editor and then try to get the tear gas out of my eyes. Uh, <laughs> And so that's what I did. And I was therefore part of a Pulitzer. Um, uh, I actually wasn't there the day uh, that the raid happened, but I had been there many days before. Um, it was a young, uh, another young reporter named Carolyn Salazar who was there. She ended up getting the byline um, mm. that was on the front page. I was assigned to do an inside story about the religious reaction to it, the religious community's reaction to it. But that was enough to be a part of the team. The Pulitzer mm. was for team coverage of a breaking mm. news event. I call uh, that the Pulitzer for being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and it just, my career went from there. I went on to work for uh, NPR's Marketplace and then to be a news director at the local NPR station until like it all went to a crashing uh, end 10 years ago when uh, I lost my job at the local NPR station and I wasn't able to find uh, another job. Um, and that is the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. And, is, and sir, you... You told me that part of the reason you lost your job was even though you were successful was it wasn't about performance. It was that you'd misread the culture of the place. I wanted you to dive into that a little bit more. <laughs> Am I allowed to curse? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a not one way of saying I was an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's, let's be honest. I was a arrogant prick know-it-all who had had nothing but success in his entire life who uh, was pretty obnoxious to work with. Um, and I um, I alienated people. You know, we won uh, more than 70 awards the year that I was let go, mm. the year that I was fired. Yeah. Um, and what what I misread was that I thought by winning these big awards and, um, you know, I had an amazing team. I, ass I assembled this incredible set of talent. In fact, some of the people, uh, several of the people that I brought in are now national uh, correspondence for NPR. Mm. Uh, these were they were kids at the time when I brought mm. them in. Um, so I had this incredibly talented, young, striving team, and we were just kicking butt and taking names. And I just was really reckless. Um, that, that must have been such. I mean, to go from winning all those awards, winning the Pulitzer, that must have been just like a a huge sock in the gut to to get fired like that. It was gutting. You know, somebody said, uh, you know, that was that guy was a politician in a hurry. I was a journalist in a hurry. And we well, know a lot of but a lot of journalists are like that. I mean, that's what drives them. That's what makes them great. That's what actually that's kind of why I didn't pursue the profession uh, beyond doing dabbling a little bit in college was I felt like I didn't have enough of that that drive in me. You know, it's great until it isn't. It's great until it drives you into a wall. It's great until it alienates people. It's great until it messes up your family relationships. Like, I can tell you for a fact that to be in a hurry is not a good idea. Mm. Uh, whether you're a journalist or a politician, it means you're cutting corners. It means that you're not attending to relationships. And that's what happened to me. I mean, it was the most difficult lesson, the most humbling lesson, the most gutting lesson. I mean, I lost my professional identity. I lost my ikigai. I lost mm -hmm. my friends. Most of them were in the newsroom. Um, you know, thank God for my wife and my parents who loved me throughout. I had a nine-month-old child. I didn't know mm -hmm. how I was going to take care of her. Um, so it, it was it was by far the most difficult experience of my life. Um, you know, I remember saying to someone, I love the path you were uh, I said to someone, I love the path I was on. And he said, you mean the rut. And that really woke me up to the fact that this was an opportunity, an opportunity mm. to reinvent and ultimately find a better place uh, for me professionally. And um, now, it's I, interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, just really quick. I think of journalism as, journalism as my first love. Um, and I don't know about you if you married your first love, probably not. Like, 
that first love is overheated. That first love is not sustainable. That first love, you're like too into it almost. Like you're too mm. emotional. And that first love isn't always the best fit. Um, and that was journalism for me. Like ultimately I have found a much more mature love in entrepreneurship than what I ever had with journalism. And I even knew, you know, the world works in funny ways, but like I knew back when I was a high flying journalist that this wasn't going to be forever. Interesting. Well, it was it just a case of it was working out OK for you up until that point. You'd gotten jobs, you'd gotten promotions, you'd been put in positions of responsibility. But that doesn't mean that you had a passion for it. No, it wasn't that it was mostly having my child, my daughter. Um, and I just realized that there was something in the world that mattered more to me than being a successful journalist. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really convinced I could be a good dad to her and, and be a journalist as mm -hmm. well. And I'll give you like a really concrete example. When I was a foreign correspondent for NPR's Marketplace, I used to travel around with a packed suitcase in my trunk. Wow. Yeah. There was one time when Hurricane Katrina hit, mm -hmm. when I went straight to the airport and didn't return for four months. Oh, jeez, that's crazy. And, and that is not, I mean, ask many journalists, that's not atypical, you know yeah. what I mean? And, yeah. and how do you raise mm. a child? So I think what happened is, you know, any of you who are dads will know this, um, you know, the mom changes in, in the process of being pregnant, her body changes, her, her mentality changes. The dad, the change comes later. Right. Like there's not a lot to do in the first months of birth. You know, the the mom is really attached to the, the baby's really attached to the mom. The dad's dawning realization of parenthood and fatherhood usually comes later. And most dads can even point to the moment when they realize what it was to be dad. For me, it was the day that I lost my job. Mm. And I thought, you know what? Uh, it's not about me anymore. Like I was the breadwinner in the family. My, my, my wife at the time was working, uh, was on maternity leave. Uh, we had no income. Um, it, the, the, the experience of losing my job was so much more than just the personal. It was about like for the first time in my life, I needed to go and find money. Yeah. Um, so that that was that was, I think, the, the reason I knew journalism wasn't going to be sustainable for me was just because it took too much of my life force and it didn't leave enough for my family. It also is is a, a profession that over the last twenty years has become less and less paid. The pay has gone down, so that's that's challenging in itself when you're raising a family, especially in an expensive place like Miami. Um, how did you find your way to entrepreneurship after that? Yeah, it's a bit of a winding journey, but basically, um, my first job after journalism, like so many of us former media people, was in PR, and then. Uh, I never was a big fan of PR, but I was interested in marketing. Um, so I started, so I got a job. Uh, I convinced the people that hired me to do PR for them to let me also oversee their digital marketing department. Um, and I only spent a year in that job, but it basically gave me a little bit of a start. It was enough to get me hired at the local community college to teach a class in marketing. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a really funny story. It was called the Idea Center at Miami Dade College. Leandro Finol was the executive director. And he liked my resume, you know, having been a former, you know, journalist. And um, I was a senior director of digital marketing at a billion dollar company. And so he sits me down. He hires me to teach the first ever class at Miami Dade College for small businesses and marketing. And he says, OK, what's our first step? And I look at him straight in the eye and I say, we need to hire a co-instructor. <laughs> <laughs> and he leans back in his chair and just leads the biggest laugh you've ever seen. And he's like, yeah. OK, go find a co-instructor. Uh -huh. He knew he knew that I didn't really know marketing. I just knew storytelling. And so what mm. ended up happening is I hired a, a wonderful uh, co-instructor named Michael Schott, uh, who is Colombian. Uh, non-native English speaker. And I literally spent the whole time like translating. Uh, he spoke fluent English, but he spoke, you know, digital marketing ease. Mm. And so I would like, he would like give the lesson. And then I would say what he's saying is, and I would like translate it into more understandable, uh, plain English. And for the first two years, we taught, we co-taught the course that way, where he would develop the slides. He would explain them using complicated language. And I would re-explain them using simple language. And, um, and, and, I, while I was doing that, I was uh, I was now working at a startup as their head of growth, and I was very successful in the role. We went from pre-revenue to a $3.5 million 
run rate and a $15 million uh, exit in, in three years. Um, and I was a principal of the company um, and it was a extraordinary uh, run, but um, what the, but it was a lot of work and very stressful. And when I would go and teach these classes, um, my, my, the students, the participants, the business owners would, would pull me aside and say, Dan, it's like so obvious to us that you do not like your day job and you love this teaching. You should really quit the day job and go teach. And so um, I, I, I went and I took a, a retreat and I walked, uh, did a silent retreat for a day and I asked, where is my joy? And I meditated on where is my joy? And it just was really clear to me that this teaching was uh, was what I loved. So I did end up, uh, when the company was acquired, we I saw it through the acquisition and then had a... Oh, Dan. Teaching job at Miami Dade. It College. cut out for a second there, but uh, you you said um, when the company was acquired, you yeah. So when the company was acquired, I had the opportunity to get a big payout and move to Las Vegas, uh, and I chose to uh, let let uh, to not take the payout, quit the job. I also quit my teaching job at uh, Miami Dade College, and I started BizHack Academy, and that was the beginning of. Uh, you know, like so many technicians, um, I was like a, a a person who loved baking pies who started a bakery. I yep. was a guy who loved teaching classes who started a teaching academy. Um, and for several years, it wasn't a business, it was a course. And I just got really good at selling this course, sold it to uh, more than 700 uh, business owners, uh, more than a million dollars in revenue uh, over the course of several years, selling one course. Mm, um, and over which time, is what it's just so much more entrepreneurial than you know teachers who um do kind of the same thing but they do it within a structure of a university or a high school or something like that you actually took the course and sold it over and over again um, exactly and i think to my credit i always knew that uh this was just a course this wasn't a business uh, a business is not made up of a single product, um, and 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 but I but I knew that was going to be my go to market. I just didn't know it was going to take so long to figure out what the business was, uh, and I was agitated. You know, it was, it, and and there were ups and there were downs. You know, when we were an in person training academy, and then COVID happened, I had to mm -hmm. essentially cancel every class, and the business uh, nearly had to shut down. We pivoted to online training, and then the COVID year, a year when people had money and time because of mm -hmm. government. Funding mm -hmm. and the lockdown uh, was the best year in the history of BizHack. And then mm -hmm. when they reopened and people didn't have money or time was the <laughs> worst year in the history of BizHack. And so yes. I went from these high highs to these low lows. And, and finally, you know, here at the end of 2023, when we're talking, I'm finally settling into this um, this wonderful place. And I have found my Ikigai again. And what my new Ikigai, uh, my mature Ikigai, my my what I think will be the love of the rest of my professional life is I really love training, uh, to working with small business support organizations, you know, like, uh, you know, EO, which we're both a member of, like uh, some score. of these other score um, yeah. to train small businesses in yeah. market so they can grow faster. It's it's really interesting. You know, I my I'm the son of a journalist. My father was a journalist for 30 plus years. Um, I was editor of my high school newspaper, went to a journalism camp in high school, which I say is kind of like band camp, only nerdier. Um, and then, you know, found my way to entrepreneurship. And so there's these parallels between both of our common experiences. One of the things that you said was that both professions agree that we're not a fit for anything else. In other words, if you're a journalist or if you're an entrepreneur, it's probably in part because you're not great at doing a lot of other things. So you end up falling into that. And then another parallel I would draw between the two is that you can constantly be searching for information, for more information, be educating yourself. And that's kind of core to what you do, both as an entrepreneur and as a journalist. Any other reflections on the parallels between the two and that kind of drew you to both? Thank, thank you for asking the question, waiting for me to ask answer it for 20 minutes, and then finally just reminding me what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my take. Feel free to disagree. No, no, I love it. No, it, it just, it's funny. It's like, oh, yeah, that was the question he asked. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, to, to build on that, um, both journalists and entrepreneurs are very extreme personalities, and we're both really not fit for human society. 
But the nature of the extreme, the extremity of our personality is very different. Um, and, and I love both cohorts with, with all my heart. So journalists are this weird set of contradictory personality types. Number one, journalists are extremely cynical. And they're very idealistic mm. when it comes to the importance of a free press. But they're super cynical, like they always assume you're lying to them. You know, there's a there's a great line, um, which is, uh, you know, they say, uh, uh, you know, uh, if, 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 you, if she says she's your mother, uh, you need a second source. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, you know, that kind of trust but verify is really embedded in us. And, and we end up becoming kind of paranoid because we're constantly being lied to. Mm -hmm. So there's that kind of weird, like cynic cynical, idealistic combo. And then the other thing uh, that's really weird about journalists, but really consistent it, when you start to get to know us, is journalists tend to be extremely introverted, uh, often very kind of analytical, and yet we're in a profession that constantly forces us to talk to people. And I actually think a lot of journalists precisely use journalism for that reason, because they otherwise it'd be in some hole, uh, you know, and it forces us to to talk to people. Entrepreneurs are um, essentially most of us are either manic depressive or ADHD. <laughs> um, and we there's this like almost hyperactive energy that you can probably detect a little bit in me. Uh, I'm not ADHD, but I'm on the spectrum for sure. Mm -hmm. But that like just this, we vibrate really fast. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, especially what Gino Wickman would call the visionary entrepreneur. Uh, one of my mentors uh, says that a, to be a visionary entrepreneur is a diagnosis. <laughs> um, and so, you know, really most entrepreneurs are unemployable. Um, and I call them, you know, they're basically, they started a business because no one else but themselves would hire themselves. Um, but the, the, the same quality that makes us, you know, many, many of us, like I, I'm not this, I, I, I went to a good school and so forth, but many of us have dropped out of high school, many of us dropped out of college, uh, never really felt like we found a fit, um, you know, in, in formal schooling. Um, a lot of what made it so difficult for entrepreneurs to fit into normal society and school is what made them willing and able to take the risk to go after their big idea and turn it into a reality. That that kind of Steve Jobs uh, reality um, bending uh, force field. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of you know ADHD. Bill, Bill Gates, um, uh, Walt Disney. Um, uh, Virgin Airlines, uh, Richard Branson, Richard all Branson. have acknowledged mm -hmm. that they have ADHD. And El Elon um, Musk on the spectrum. Yeah, Elon Musk is definitely yeah. on the spectrum. Um, you know, and 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 these really, if you surround yourself, if you know yourself and surround yourself with the right people, th these actually can become incredible assets when you're yeah, starting it, and growing a business. It, it's interesting because you 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 knew what you're passionate about. You know what you like doing. You also know what your superpower is, which is teaching and training. And then you eventually evolve the business into doing more fractional CMO work and training on marketing. Let's talk a little bit about some of the, the areas that you train regard to marketing today as we record this at the end of 2023, because with the rise of ChatGBT and AI, there's a lot of change that's happening for small business owners with regards to marketing today. Yeah. So we'll talk about two things. One is the more boring but important one. And then the second one is the AI thing that everybody wants to talk about. Let's talk about the boring but important. First of all, marketing is actually two things. And I think business owners sometimes don't realize this. Marketing is lead generation. So marketing is a way for you to basically get qualified leads to your salespeople and get them to sell them and to generate revenue. But marketing is also brand building and thought leadership, which does not have a direct tie to revenue, but is a rising tide that floats all boats. And the number one mistake that a lot of business owners make is that they only value lead generation and they don't recognize the important role that brand building and thought leadership have. So anyway, we teach both of them. We teach brand building and we teach what we call thought leadership. Uh, thought leadership means just basically becoming an influencer in your industry so people trust you. Now, why is this important? Because people 
buy from people they like and they trust. So if you're a thought leader, um, as you are, uh, John, and and as people, um, you know, people buy from you because they like you, because they trust you, because they listen to your podcast, and your podcast is excellent. You do your homework, and you they know that when you take care of them, you're going to take care of them just like you're taking care of me, and you're going to put the same care into them that you're putting into me. So that's thought leadership, right? Um, it's hard for the, you to attribute a sale to that, but it's part of the mix of of things that people consider when they try to decide whether they want to hire rise. Now. Lead gen, right, is running a digital ad that is targeted to a specific person with a very particular call to action that gets them to get an irresistible offer, that gets them into the door with that free irresistible offer that you then begin to move them along a customer journey that ends in a sale and then an upsell, right? And that's the other half of marketing, but for most small businesses, that's all that marketing is. So anyway, we teach both. And then the other piece of this is the accelerant uh, that is AI. So ChatGPT and other AI tools are the most powerful productivity tool in a generation. And you can do, we, we call it a thousand X, 10 times better, 10 times more, 10 times faster. And the one thing I would add to that is you can also do 10 times the number of things that you could have done with your current budget. So it's almost like, 10,000 X. It's just this extraordinary accelerant. Mm. Um, it makes you so much more productive and it really changes the roles that you need in a company. For instance, when you're in a marketing setting, you as the business owner can probably draft with the help of ChatGPT most of the copy that you need for emails, social media, um, a website, just through a conversation with ChatGPT, and then what you really need is a really strong editor who knows your company to then take that raw material and then really uh, hone it for the specifics of your company and your target audience. So for instance, in my company, I no longer have uh, a copywriter. Um, instead, I have hired two types of editors, a copy editor who um, is more of a strategic uh, editor who who makes sure that the copy aligns with my strategic goals, and then a line editor who looks for typos. Mm. And I pay uh, about eighty dollars an hour for the strategic editor and a lot less for the line editor because I just don't want any typos in my text before it goes out. Mm. Um, that's a change. And so I've saved you know hundreds of thousands of dollars at this point in my business through efficiencies. Um, there's actually one quick thing I'll mention because a lot of people don't know about this. If you download the ChatGPT app, you'll notice when you see the prompt that there's this little headphones icon and you press the headphones icon and it will begin a conversation with you. And so you can use your hands free while you're walking or driving and you can have a conversation with ChatGPT. So I often will draft my email sequences or my blog posts in conversation with ChatGPT, hands-free while walking down the boardwalk. Wow, that's amazing. Go get some exercise while you're getting some work done at the same time. So cool. Walk and talk, baby. Yeah. Walk and talk. <laughs> I think Steve Jobs often talked about walk and talk. I know for me, who's a little bit you know spastic, um, I think best when I am in the mo in movement. Mm, and so yeah. it really like I don't know why, but when I'm moving and walking, I know I don't know if you ever like take a phone call and you walk around pace. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, but I, yeah, but yeah, but it's it's that, but without another human being, it's actually. But what's really cool is the voices um, are very human like, and they even incorporate ums and pauses. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there's another one, Pi, which I played around with. It's an app as well, a little bit more conversational, a little bit more human, I think. Um, so I encourage people to check that out. Uh, Dan, I know we're at time, so I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. Where can people go to learn more about you and connect with you and learn about biz hack Academy? Do we have to end? This is too much fun. I I'm having a blast here, but I, I like to be respectful of my guest time. So, uh, yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Um, well, uh, so what biz hack really focuses on is we work with business support organizations like chambers of commerce, networking groups, uh, and we provide training to their small business members, any organization that has a mission of serving small businesses. And you can learn more about us at bizhack.com. That's B-I-Z-H-A-C-K.com. Would also love to connect with you on social media. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn as Dan Gretsch. Uh, and you can find us uh, on all of the social channels at BizHack Academy.
And go subscribe for his email newsletter because I've been on your email list. You share a lot of uh, useful resources and things like that. So I encourage people to do that. Yeah, and I did have one last thing to mention, which is we do run a free masterclass series uh, that is funded by the local Miami-Dade government, but is open to anyone. And we've done uh, we've done more than a hundred of them. We've won four national awards. You can go to bizhack.com slash MC for masterclass. MC, uh, and we'd love to have you there. That's very cool. Dan, thank you so much. Thank you.